Just do a little sound check here. Make sure I'm on the right microphone. Mute my YouTube here. I think we are live. Yes, we are live. So uh, I was a little nervous. Uh, internet is a little bit sketchy here. So um, hopefully we can make it through an hour live stream without too much troubles here. I did a little internet test. It's basically at the minimum upload download speed. Low, but probably should be doable. So hopefully you can see me and you can hear me and um, we can actually have some type of show today. So um, let me know in the comment section if there's something wrong, sound wise, video wise, it all looks good to me. So we'll just wait for a few more people to roll in here and then we will get started talking about the VIX. So thank you everybody for joining me here today. I think this is episode 17 of our public live streams. We do many more private ones, but um, Episode 17, public, we're going to talk about the VIX index today. So um, w one thing that I notice, and um, I would say about all the questions that I get asked over the years, emails, you know, people asking DMs and whatnot, probably about 30 to 40% of them have to do with something related to timing volatility spikes in some capacity. So that's either people asking me when it's time to buy VIX calls or when it's time to buy the VXX or the UVXY. This is a topic that is incredibly popular as far as people and their volatility trading journey. Um, not to call anybody beginners or experts or whatnot. I, I don't really differentiate that way, but what I do notice is that there's an awful lot more people who are interested in trying to profit off timing volatility spikes rather than more what I do, which is trying to profit from longer term trend following, which would of course land you more on the short volatility side of things. But this question of long vol and when it's time to jump in and make that big profit, it really does seem to be a very common subject. So I've noticed recently with the stock market doing reasonably well, but people thinking that maybe it's uh, running on fumes and maybe the VIX is ready to spike. I'm getting a lot of questions talking about how the VIX is very low and it's been low for a while. So is now the time to jump in and strike? And um, essentially that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm going to try to give people an idea of where we're at in the current VIX cycle, but more importantly, give you a little bit of perspective on what average truly is because um, as I'll get into in a few minutes, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but average VIX can be looked at in a few different ways. And we're going to go over that. And then I'm going to give you my actual, here's what I think the average VIX is, and here's where we are right now. And then of course, we'll go into the open q and I know a lot of people don't really have anywhere that they can get their questions answered. So I like to be here for you and uh, open it up to any questions that come in, volatility, investing related, whatever you want. We'll probably do a completely off topic one soon. I think that'll be interesting. A lot of people are asking me to just do a full, you know, hour and a half long off topic live stream. So uh, maybe I'll get myself a bottle of wine and open that up to questions about non-investing related, more of my personal life, and uh, at least sit through one of those for you. So look forward to that soon. But let me do a one minute of housekeeping. And then of course, we'll get started talking about what the average VIX truly is. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really do appreciate the support. So my name's Brent Osachoff. I'm a Canadian and I'm a former professional golfer. So you will hear the odd golf analogy slipped in there from time to time. I run, I love movies, diehard UFC fan, and I do love to travel. So you'll see this background change throughout the year. So just give me one minute here to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you do feel like you need a little more structure in your investing, I do also manage a private investing community with members from over 65 countries around the world. And it's all centered around both of our diversified portfolios. You can choose the one that best suits your personal level of risk tolerance. There's a daily email sent out every morning with a ton of very useful volatility metrics at the top, which you can learn more about each one of them and start applying them to your own trading. There's a daily article or video where I break down some of the most requested topics from members. And then most importantly, of course, in every email every day, I state exactly what position each of my strategies will be in, along with all the allocation sizing and risk management that goes with them. 
I've made it easy to follow so you can get the same consistent performance the VTS community has enjoyed for over nine years now. No obligation, but if this is something you may be interested in, go to volatilitytradingstrategies.com, click the subscribe tab, and the monthly subscription does come with a free two-week trial so you can check it all out before committing. Thanks again for supporting the YouTube channel and spending a little bit of time with me here today. So let's get on with the show. Okay, welcome everybody to episode 17 of the Volatility Barometer. I am here in Panama, if you can recognize the background, right, oh, sorry, cameras are reversed. Right here is a fairly famous, um, I don't speak a word of Spanish, but it's the Cinta Cabrera or something like that. I don't even know. Um, it's frustrating being here because I literally don't speak one word of Spanish. And the people here don't speak really hardly any English. But very cool place. Um, had some really nice runs along this water. So uh, that's the background. If anybody's wondering, it's Panama City. But uh, let's start talking about the VIX index because it is probably the most widely quoted, talked about, hashtagged, volatility metric out there. And that's a little bit unfortunate for someone like me who talks about volatility so much, given how I personally feel. It's one of the worst metrics that can be used. As far as absolute values, it's nearly worthless. And even when you're trying to combine it with other metrics, it's really hit and miss. And it's not overly useful in my personal trading, but it is the one that everybody knows and loves. So anyway, this is the VIX index for the past one year. And the reason this question that I'm getting so often recently is coming up is because it does appear like the VIX index is quite low, right? It's right now, I mean, it reached intraday lows of 14, but it, it reached some lows of the 16, 17 range. And even yesterday when the markets opened, I believe it opened, you know, below 17 or close to it. Yeah, 1680. So it was just the tail end of yesterday that it shot up to 1845. But I'm getting a lot of people asking, well, since the VIX is so low, clearly this must be a great time to buy VIX calls, right? That's what we're going to talk about today, whether this actually does represent a low VIX or not. So hopefully you can see my charts here. I always like to double check if I'm doing a screen share. All right. Looks good. Wiggle this around so it's visible. Um, okay, so this is the VIX index since 1990. Now, it is important to know that the VIX calculation itself has undergone a few changes over the years. The last meaningful one, I suppose, we could say 2004, but back in 93, there was a big change. Before that, it's using, you know, what's called the VXO calculation, the S&P 100. But more or less, given plus or minus a point or so, we can look at a general VIX index going back to 1990. And this is what it looks like. So we can clearly see that there's an average here. The mean is a word that just basically means the average. And the average VIX is 1949. So I suppose I could end the video right here. I could say that since the VIX right now is 1845 and the long-term average is 1949, clearly right now we are in a lower than average volatility regime. But I wouldn't be doing a live stream if that was the simplicity of the case, which it is, of course, not. And we're going to get into that now. But we can see a few trends here. Obviously, there's been two major spikes. Financial crisis in 2008 was a big one. COVID was a very sharp drop. It didn't last quite as long. You can see the width of it wasn't quite as big as the COVID. We saw just a phenomenal recovery after the COVID. Probably a lot of people are going to be saying it's Fed-induced, and I agree. And just flooding the economy with trillions of dollars of stimulus, that will obviously help. But it did reach some pretty high levels. But this is the VIX since 1990. So we're looking at, what, 27 years, basically? Or, sorry, um, <laughs> 21 years. Um, these are the average annual means. And I think this is slightly more important to look at because daily values can fluctuate quite a bit. But when you're looking at volatility regimes from a trader's perspective, we're looking at longer term than just a day. I like to look at longer term periods that a trader can actually anticipate and benefit from. So we can see again right here, there's this blue line for 2021. This year's VIX average is 2026, just a little bit higher than the long term mean. So again, people could be forgiven for thinking that right now is sort of average or slightly below average. I'm just going to expand this to five years. Let people see that, well, 
It's actually not. You can see that while it is relatively low compared to where we were at during COVID, it is certainly not low compared to where we were even in the somewhat volatile years of 2018 and 2019, 2020, it's still a little bit higher than the long term. So we have to dig a little bit deeper than what is called the mean, but just for people's interest sake, so we can also learn a little bit of statistics jargon. I'm sure most people know this, but let's just go through what the mean and then various different ways to measure average actually is. So my spreadsheets freeze all the time because they're way too big. Let's make this big. And I'm just going to go through a basic example. I always use this because it's super simple. So we're taking a series of numbers, three, three, four, six, nine, and we will look at what the mean is. Okay, so what the mean is, is basically the average. So all you can do is just take the average. It's basically adding up five numbers and dividing by five, right? This adds up to 25, divide by how many values there were. The mean is five, and that's what this is showing. This is essentially just saying, if we add up all the VIX index values, right? All of these values going from 1990 all the way up to 2021, the average of all of them divided by how many values there are, we get that number of 1949. But the problem, hopefully people understand the problem with this, if you were to imagine, say, if you wanted to know, maybe you have kids, you wanna know if your kid is average height, right? And you've got a class of 20, your, your kid's in a class of 20 students, and you wanna know whether they're average. If you just add up the height of all 20 students and divide by 20, that will be what's called the mean. But what if there's one kid in that class, you know, it's grade five and he or she is already extremely tall and is an outlier. Maybe there's a kid in the class who's six feet tall and he's only 12 years old. That's gonna bring up the average of the rest of the class. Or incomes, right? The, if you look at a country, the, av the average income in a country. Well, you do have people like Bill Gates. You've got people like Jeff Bezos and all the one percenters out there, that's going to significantly bring up that average. So when you add them all up and divide by how many there are, depending on what type of population you're looking at, that might heavily skew the results. So what we actually want to look at, and for trading purposes, I believe it is a little bit more meaningful to do what's called a median. Now, I'm sure I, I don't mean to be condescending. I'm sure most of you know these words, but I'm going to go slow just for the people that you know, they want to catch up on the statistics behind this. So the median is essentially the middle number in a series of numbers. So going back to our example, if we do this same thing, three, three, four, six, nine, super easy example, the median is the middle number. So it, it's four, right? So if we just do the median of these, it's going to be four. The median is the middle number. So if you're talking about that classroom full of kids, Figuring out whether your kid is, if there's 20 students close to that student number 10, is going to give you a better idea of whether your kid is the median. If your median income in the country, that will put you at the 50th person or 50th percentile person in the population, regardless of how many Warren Buffetts and how many super rich Mark Zuckerbergs there are out there, you're going to be that 50th percentile. So with respect to the VIX index, if we just rank from low to high, all of these super high values that we do occasionally see, financial crisis, this one, March 16th, 2020, 8269, all of these values are going to bring it up substantially. So of course, we want to kind of weed those out a little bit. They're important for traders. I'm not saying we discard them. But as far as figuring out the average, the dead center middle number of the VIX distribution is actually 1735. So then we can compare that to where we're sitting now. You know, it's a, it's a little bit different. Make sure I'm on screen share. I make that mistake all the time. Um, yeah, so now you can see that the median VIX is actually below where we are now. I personally feel, and this is just a personal thing to the way that I trade and my methodology, the median is far more meaningful than the mean. The reason being that I am a tactical investor. I use volatility metrics to filter through the noise and try to catch longer term trends. Longer term meaning multiple days, right? I would say medium term trends. Few days, few weeks, if we get lucky and get a couple of months of a trend, that's fantastic. But that's what I'm looking for. And for me and the way that I invest, it's quite easy for me to filter out the really obvious outlier signals. So I'm actually much more interested in the bulk of this chart 
But there's actually a part of this that I'm even more interested in is essentially asking the question of where does the VIX hang out the most? Where does it spend the most amount of its time? Because for a trend following investor, that's really the question we want to figure out. What does the VXX, for example, do most of the time? We can filter out the noise and we can miss all the big spikes and that's fairly easy to do, at least if you're following the right metrics. But what does it do most of the time? Those are the pertinent questions that we want to ask. So there is another way to go about this that is actually just as or maybe even more meaningful than the median. It's called the mode. Now the mode is essentially what I'm getting at. It is the most common number in a series of numbers. So in this series, of course, there's two threes there. So the mode will be the most common number in this sequence. It'll be the three. That means it spends the most amount of time with a three handle on there. The VIX mode is the same thing. We can have a distribution of all the VIX values and we can show that while the mean is 1949, all values added together and divided by how many there were since 1990, the median dead center middle number, the 50th percentile is 1735. Where it spends the most amount of its time is with a 12 handle and then a 13, and then just barely 14, and then 11. So you can see, for a trend-following investor, where does the VIX spend the majority of its time? The actual answer is probably closer to 12, 13, 14, somewhere in that range. And we can see that clearly right here. Now, don't let this one throw you. There wasn't an enormous amount of those values. I just started bunching them in fives because from 30 to 31, 32, there's far less values. So these are all, when we get above 30, I started grouping them in fives. But essentially it would just drop off in a nice smooth straight line. And of course, the longer the data we have, while it does go back to 1990 from a statistical perspective, that's actually a very short data set. So there's a, you know, a little bit of stepping going on here. It's not quite consistent, but this is exactly what it would look like. And when we have a hundred years of data, it's going to look like a very nice distribution, heavily skewed to the left side, which is where the VIX likes to spend the majority of its time. If we go back, say 10 years, you can clearly see that. I have to make this two days just so we can see it. But we can see that Yes, the VIX actually does like to center around much lower values. And there are some years, of course, where it gets extremely low, whereas the VIX mean chart, these are the annual means again. There's that 2017, hopefully we all remember that year. This can happen in the markets. We saw an annual average of 11.09. That's incredibly low, of course. But even ignoring the outlier, there was several, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years in the last, since 1990, that averaged VIX below 15. And that's what we're getting at with this mode, where the average VIX is actually significantly lower when you start looking at it from a practical perspective. So sure, we can just very easily, if somebody asks you what the average VIX is, if you come back and say 1949, you're not wrong. I mean, that's technically a way to calculate average. And to be honest, the most popular way to calculate average. But if you're a trader, does that really matter? That is the 50th average, but we can filter out the noise there. So I actually like the median of 1735 and the mode of 1242 a whole lot better than I like the mean of 1949. So when people ask me, what's the average VIX? I would probably say around 14, you know, maybe 13 and a half if you do a straight average, 14 or 15 is a really good number to target. So now that we're seeing the VIX index, what people are saying is low, remember it's relatively low, but it's not low. So if you're one of those traders who thinks, well, surely it has to spike up back to 40 again soon because it's gotten so low, essentially you're probably just looking at a very short data set. What you really need to understand is that low volatility begets lower volatility. It sort of becomes the norm in the market. People get more used to it and volatility can just go lower and lower. Now, I'm certainly not saying that it couldn't spike and it definitely could have one of these sort of temporary spikes. I think it would take an enormous amount right now to get over 40. That would be a, 
a full catastrophic failure of all the stimulus that went through and maybe a second wave scare and all that stuff. But seeing one of these spikes, that can happen. Hopefully you're not the type of trader that's actually going to put money towards trying to bet on the exact day that that's going to happen, because that's really not a good bet. We're trying to be trend followers. We're trying to determine when is a good time to be on which side of the trade. So for all these people that have been emailing me recently and really ramping it up this week, talking about how it's got to be a great time to buy VIX options, got to be a great time to buy the UVXY. I can't tell you what to do and what not to do, of course. Um, but as far as trying to determine where we're at in the volatility cycle, I would say volatility has been persistently high, stubbornly high. I think that just given the realized volatility in the market, given how things are moving around, we are near or at all time highs, depending on what day you're looking at it. The VIX at 1850 right now, I would say in a historical perspective, is very high. When you compare the VIX right now, implied volatility, to the realized volatility of the S&P, I would say it's pretty high right now. So there's no historical backing for saying that now is a fantastic time to go long vol. There's really no data that I'm seeing for that. Now, if you have intuition and you trade on your hunches, hey, do your thing, you do you. But I don't trade that way. I look for longer term trends. And just remember that the VIX index, while the average is closer to 20, it actually spends an awful lot of its time with a 12 or 13 handle. And those are the periods where we're gonna make the most money. Trying to time those spikes, it's not what you're gonna boost your portfolio performance for the next 30 years. Trying to isolate longer, medium and long-term trends, that's where the money's at. That's what I focus my time and effort on. I don't pay any attention to trying to time those spikes and you know, I'm gonna, Yes, it's true that if you do happen to catch it correctly, you can make an awful lot of money in a short period of time. But uh, the number of times that you'll just be completely wrong, it more than outweighs it. So it's kind of one of those things where long vol is an insurance product. It's essentially what it is. It behaves exactly as insurance. And you are paying insurance consistently with those long vol. Almost always you're going to lose your premium. And then eventually you're going to get something that pays out. But what we know statistically, at least through time, is that the money that you spend month to month and you just burn through will probably add up to a higher value than the bonus months where you time it completely correct. So um, just remember that long volatility is a notoriously difficult trade to make money on. And um, that the number of people that actually do when you stretch it out over five to 10 years, you know, your, your tail risk funds, your long vol funds, extremely difficult to make money on. And I guarantee you the people that do, they go far deeper than what I went into, but they certainly know about what actual averages are, where the actual trends land in the distribution, how heavily skewed to the left side it is. Very important to keep in mind. So um, hopefully that uh, gives you some ideas. Certainly for all those people that emailed me, I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm not telling you you can't do what you want to do with your money. Just have some historical perspective. Understand that an 18 handle in the VIX, I don't care how many Bloomberg articles you see that says the VIX is 20, the average VIX is 20 and now it's low. Don't care how many are written. I know there's a lot of them. You don't need to forward them to me. I understand that that's the common misconception, but have some historical perspective. The VIX is pretty elevated right now. And uh, don't be surprised if the next few months it just continues to bleed lower. Of course, we always have to leave room for the possibility of short-term spikes. Um, always stay hedged, always stay well balanced in your allocations. But um, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna be doing any guesswork with our investing. This is real money. This is a twenty to thirty year process, not a you know one week process. And long vol is a very very difficult trade. So keep that in mind. When somebody tells you the average VIX is twenty, now you'll be well equipped to tell them. Oh, you mean the mean? Well, it's actually closer to 14 and you can tell them why now. So that's my little spiel on the VIX index. We can open it up to questions now. You can ask about what we just talked about or as always, I would imagine it's gonna be a lot of UVXY, VXX, options, trades, questions, go for it. Ask me anything. Ah, bad coffee. 
I'm basically addicted to my Nespresso machine. And because I'm traveling, I don't have one. Hotel coffee's the worst. Hate it. All right, let's try to catch up on some of these questions. So, what do I think about the medallion fund? Is he using some volatility techniques? Do you think your fund could beat him? Okay, there's a few. Well, first of all, I don't like to talk about other people's work because I'm never privy to the back information about what they're doing. And finding accurate statistics on performance is difficult, of course. A lot of these types of funds are strictly prohibited from marketing. Um, you, you know, you, they can't solicit clients. There's, there's layers of rules that we don't really ever know what the performance is going to look like. Now, you can Google around and you can get some ideas and certainly there's articles written, but there's nowhere that I can go to actually just get, you know, the monthly results. But I also have an idea of what it, what it is, probably like you. We have a pretty good idea that this is a phenomenally uh, successful fund. There's a few problems here um, comparing to something like this. First of all, a lot of it is things that are not accessible for retail traders like me and like you, I would assume. Um, you know, some quant stuff, high frequency stuff that, you know, high volume, capitalizing on little inefficiencies, arbitrage. We can't do any of that on the retail side. It's perhaps in years past, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there was an opportunity to do stuff like that. But those, you know, opportunities have long since been closed. It's, it's a very modern, fast moving computer based industry. And us retail people, as far as competing against things like this, we can't even get our foot in the door. So comparing to something that isn't apples to apples wouldn't be fair. Um, my performance beating this long term, I'd say I have some work to do because the numbers that I've seen from this fund, um, so I launched VTS, actually we're coming up on our 10th anniversary. So I launched VTS um, almost 10 years ago. And so of course that fund has been going for much longer, but our, our unleveraged sort of safest portfolio is this one. This is the live results since I launched 10 years ago. And we're at about, you know, just about 20%. Low drawdowns, very high risk adjusted metrics, super, super low correlation to the S&P. This is actually the number I'm most proud of is just the ultra low correlation to the S&P. That's nearly impossible to do to get something that performs well in bull markets, but has very, very low correlation to the equity markets. Super hard to do. But this number itself, if I'm just strictly answering your question, that is significantly lower than the numbers I've seen for that fund. So I've got some work to do. But I don't like to compare to things like that because I don't have the same accessibility. It, it's not a fair playing field. Another thing that I will say is that is just one aspect of what they do over there. And the ones that are accessible to regular people like you and I, um, I again, I don't like to badmouth other people's work Let's just say it's nowhere near as good as this um, highly exclusive fund that you are highlighting. Um, I guess it's one of those things where, you know, there's a lot of luxury things in the world where people like you and I will just never be included. I was talking to my, to uh, Vanessa recently about um, bags, you know, um, Vanessa likes bags. Uh, like Birkin bags and stuff like that. The, the value of a Birkin bag is, is pretty obvious and you can track it over time. The only problem is very few people can even get one because you have to be invited to get one. And so talking about, hey, I could buy a Birkin and make all this money. Well, no, you can't. So it's a conversation you can't even get into. It's like cars, right? You can get very expensive, exclusive vehicles that do appreciate over time very well. You can make tons of money if you can get yourself... A, the next allocation of an ultra rare hypercar, but we can't. So what are we talking about, right? You, you just, you can't get it. This fund is not accessible for me. And the way that they invest is not accessible to me. So I don't compare to that. If you want me to compare to these, this group of people and their regular funds, I destroy those. Um, the ones that are accessible for regular investors, those are, um, yeah, I, we're far, far surpassing those. This one in particular, 
it's outstanding work. Obviously, the the best of the best in the industry, but um, in my opinion, not really worth talking about because because of all the things that I said. So, um, high frequency, yeah, diversified, leveraged. I would imagine once they find a small area of arbitrage, they they would want to leverage on top of that. So that's probably a, a lot of where that's coming from. The same guys just keep losing money when they have to play by the same rules as the rest of us. Yeah, I, I think I said something similar to that. There's more here. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the names of all their funds are just absolute garbage. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, well, okay, sure. I agree with that. I just, I would probably say it in a, a slightly different way. But yeah, they're, it's very important when you're measuring things to know, can you even do it, right? That's the first question. And since I can't, um, I love what I do. It's accessible to everybody in any account structure, no matter where you are in the world, from any country in the world. That's really the strength of what I do. That's why we have investors from now 66 countries around the world is because what I do, the results that I get for people are accessible, whether you're trading in just free cash accounts, margin accounts, tax sheltered accounts, whether you're in Japan or whether you're in Dubai or Canada, it's accessible for everybody. That's what I try to provide people. It's not some hyper exclusive thing that only a select few billionaires can access or mega millionaires. I, I guess I'm an investor for the people. I'm trying to get people a, a far superior return than they can get elsewhere with something that everybody can access. I think that's extremely important. And um, yeah, so I don't compare to that medallion fund. It's phenomenal though. If that. If, that whole five minute spiel, sum it up. It's great, but we can't get into it. So who cares? Um, okay, sorry. I shouldn't highlight them until I've at least glanced at them. There's some cross talk about liberals. I don't get into politics for anybody wondering. So if you have political questions, um, save those for the completely off topic, drinking some wine type of live streams. I don't care about your political affiliations. Hopefully you don't care about mine. We're about making money. And uh, I, I, I don't think a case could be made that, for example, you know, liberals make more money than conservatives or you know, Republicans are just better investors than Democrats. None of that makes any sense. We're about making money. So, um, and we're all about good conversations too. And that often means that the person on the other side of the table significantly disagrees with you on a lot of things, but we still have to be able to talk to each other and smile and have a beer together and, and be friends afterwards, regardless of what people believe. So I don't get into politics. Edward, where's your question? In yesterday's email, you said the trade dial for the VTS rotation will reflect the change from VPU to XLU. However, the trade dial, I hope I didn't make that mistake. That's a dumb mistake. Here's yesterday's email. Yeah, I, I'll just go over it super quickly. We discussed that I'm making two very small changes to our defensive rotation strategy. The first change, fairly irrelevant. We're going from the VPU to the XLU. Um, they're virtually identical products. Uh, they're both utilities ETFs. I'm just switching to the XLU just simply because we have a lot of investors who are in the European economic area. And because of what's called the MIFID II regulations, they actually can't directly trade US-based ETFs. So they have to use stock replacement, essentially buying long call options to try to simulate a higher delta factor so that they can participate in the gains of the utilities ETF without actually holding the ETF directly. And XLU just has a more robust options market than VPU does. VPU is a Vanguard fund, it's phenomenal. I love Vanguard funds. But XLU, just from the perspective of stock replacement, is better. So we are moving to XLU. The second change, uh, we're just adding a little bit of a cash threshold so we can just catch the most extreme market crashes. I don't expect it to flag very often at all. 4.62% of the time, we're just going to move to cash instead of holding the utilities. But um, here's the big question. And you are correct, sir. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I wrote that whole blog and I didn't change this VPU to XLU. So I, I definitely apologize for that. Um, thanks for bringing it to my attention. I did not know that. Thanks, Edward. I, uh, Monday, I promise you that will be fixed for you. 
more political talk. Oh boy. So bear with me. There's a lot of political crosstalk here. I'm trying to filter through this. Um, I'll answer. Okay, so my basic rule on politics, just for people going forward, you understand. I will answer all political questions if it has some relationship to how markets might potentially move around. Those are meaningful questions to ask because there are differences between certain administrations and certain certain policies, right? Um, the The Biden administration would certainly have differences of fiscal spending and, and areas where they might distribute money compared to, say, the Trump administration and who they elect to chair the, you know, the Fed chairs and the, all the cabinet positions. These do matter. So it's not like I'm just saying, hey, if I just see the word politics or if, if you say anything regarding, I'll just ignore. I won't do that. But it has to have some bearing on the actual market. Again, I'm about making money, helping as many people as I can make money. And so filtering through stuff like this, it, it might take me a few minutes here. Let me try to find some. Okay, I like this one a lot. That's what I just said. This is a very succinct way of saying it. Who cares about politics, guys? Stay focused and make money. Absolutely. I don't care what your political affiliation is. Trust me, the UVXY or the VXX, it doesn't care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. It's, it's going to reward you if you know what you're doing, and it's going to destroy your life if you don't. Um, yeah, let's, let's keep it on topic. But if you want to talk about how politics might relate, how you know, certain Fed chairs make decisions, that is a meaningful conversation. Okay, I bought a small amount of UVXY on Thursday and sell Friday works in my favor over 50% of the time. Okay, Thomas, a few questions for you. So number one, what I like to do whenever I'm talking strategy, it's very easy to just backtest something. So I, I, I'm not trying to say you're wrong. I'm just, you're you're putting something on the table for discussion. So let's talk about this. If we were to backtest what you're saying, I can almost guarantee you there is no actual data evidence to support this. There's no weekday seasonality on the UVXY. You have to understand how the UVXY works. It functions based on a set known methodology of rolling the VIX futures. That's it. Oh, VIX, VIX Central's down. Um, VIX Central's down. So anyway, there should be an M1 contract here and an M2 contract slightly higher here. I don't know, maybe 8 or 9, 10% higher. The UVXY functions entirely on the movement of these front two VIX futures contracts. And that is it. And that is all. So another thing to keep in mind is it's not based on the actual value of them. It's based on a combination of a rolling 30-day constant maturity future. So rolling day-to-day -day has no step effect, basically. It's just a smooth rolling up and down value of those futures. So by asking this question or by, by actually implementing this strategy, you're telling me that there is a reason out there that investors find a difference between Thursday night and Friday. Like I said, I, I don't think you're going to get any data backing for that type of short-term, ultra-short-term um, seasonality. But the second thing that I was going to get at is when I'm building even the most strict rules-based quant strategies, you still do have to step back and look at it from 30,000 feet and ask yourself a few general macro questions. Why would that work? Why? Can you think of any reason, without getting into any numbers, why would there be a difference between Thursday and Friday? If you can get a serious, robust answer to that question in your mind, then maybe you can proceed forward and then you can get to the data. I would, what I suspect would happen is, A, I can't think of any reason why from Thursday to Friday there's any difference there. It's a rolling 30-day contract and VIX futures traders 
typically are not day traders. I mean, it's, it's represented much more smoothly and much more long term than that. But then when you do get to the data, I don't think it's going to support you there either. I think it's just a very short term aberration that for you, I don't know how many occurrences you've had in doing this, how many times you've actually done this and how many you skipped, right? But I think if you extended this over a longer period of time, I, I think you might find that it's, it's pretty much a coin flip. And I don't know. Again, I'm not telling you you're wrong. It's just this isn't something that I would investigate because it doesn't pass the macro test first. So I don't even want to design a system around something like that because it doesn't make sense to me conceptually. And then secondly, I really don't think there's any seasonality data that would, that would support this. So I'm, I'm really happy to see anybody make money, of course. So that part is great, that you've been doing something, you've tried to do it consistently, and you've made some money doing it. That's awesome. But sometimes we have to try to really scrutinize what we're doing and assess, is this sustainable? Or is this simply a function of the current environment that we're in? I suspect it's more the latter in this case. Here's another one, another interesting one. I've heard something similar regarding going long VIX on Fridays and selling on Monday, and this supposedly works even better if it's a three-day weekend. So when you say going long the VIX, you, you mean VIX options, right? You can't own the VIX. So there's very few ways to represent a VIX position. So yeah, this is a very common misconception as well that when you have the weekend effect in the VIX index, that there's somehow a way to arbitrage that in a trade. The problem with this, again, is that the, the VIX options themselves don't settle to the VIX spot cash index. They settle to the VIX futures. So the, the, there is a weekend effect in the VIX. You can expect that on Mondays, the VIX is going to be a little bit higher than it was on Friday. But as far as the actual application of trading, you are trading something that settles to the futures with market makers who already know about the weekend effect and have for decades. And they already start pricing that out in the markets that they're making, you know, Thursday and Friday. So that weekend effect is gone. The idea that you could, it, what used to be the case when I first started investing, like, you know, 15 years ago, I used to hear a lot of people say, you sell options on Friday, you buy them back on Monday because options decay on a calendar schedule. And on Saturday and Sunday, options are still technically decaying. So you should make a bunch of money doing this, right? Sell an option Friday, buy it back Monday, you get that weekend theta, it's free money. The problem is everybody and their dog already knows about the calendar effect, the weekend effect, the theta during calendar days versus trading days. And you know who knows about that the most is the market makers. So no, none of these things, I know they sound like they might be able to make you some money, but all of these things have been accounted for in the options market. There is no arbitrage opportunity for taking advantage of weekends in option premium or the weekend calendar effect of the VIX, which essentially is just happening because the VIX is a calendar versus trading days. And the VIX is not, you can't own the VIX. So the, it's very difficult for market makers to, you know, you can't directly hedge it out by buying shares. You can't own the VIX. So the weekend effect is just one of those things. It does exist, but there's really no way to capitalize on it from a financial perspective. And you shouldn't waste any time trying to do it. Just assume that the options market is efficient and the majority of people who are trading options, they know the same things that you know. They know that VXX decays. They know that there's a weekend effect. They know that the VIX is a calendar schedule and you can't own the underlying shares, which creates a little bit of a problem as well. They know all these things. So don't assume that there's money to be made by capitalizing. They exist and that is it and that is all. But in order to make money, you need an edge above and beyond basic information. And that stuff is, uh, you know, completely disseminated common knowledge at this point. There's no arbitrage available there. So more political stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of this. Thank you. But for everybody else, you could S&P data is available. VIX index data based, of course, the VIX is a calculation of S&P 500 options. 
that's not going to go back very far, right? We, we don't have a very long data set of S&P 500 options activity. We do have a very long data set on price and realized historical volatility. So that's definitely good. Looks like there's a little bit of programming language too, which I don't understand any of that. Maybe this, I love, if that's off chance it's reflecting me, thank you. I think this is a comment reflecting uh, uh, Jim Simons and his medallion fund over there, but um, hopefully you enjoy both of our work for different reasons. Would the risk adjusted performance increase if a weekly short S&P 500 out of the money call overlay is applied when aggressively positioned? A covered call. You're asking if our performance would be better if, for example, right now, we've been long MDY stocks, the S&P 400 mid cap for a very long time. We've been long the, the NASDAQ for a long time. We bounce around between short vol and the SPY in this strategy. But essentially your question is, would we be able to bump up our performance a little bit if we started selling covered calls? General answer, no, um, at least not the way that I trade. I think selling covered calls for me personally is one of the most overrated and to be honest, detrimental strategies that investors deploy. I understand that from a marketing perspective, it sounds great. And that's, I think, why a lot of people are led to believe it's beneficial. Um, how can you not make a strong case for that, right? You already own the stock. Why don't I just get paid a little bit more by selling some covered calls against it? The problem is when you start understanding risk reward and balancing a diversified portfolio, I'm a trend follower hopefully looking for medium to long-term trends to exist. Anytime we are long stocks, volatility is already going to be reasonably low. Those premiums are not going to be very impressive to start with. You're going to have to get a little bit close to the money in order to get any significant premium at all. But that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for longer-term trends where the stocks are going up. I don't want to cap my gains and be on the hook for giving up my shares if we cross those thresholds, which we will regularly. So then you might say, well, you can just keep rolling them out. That's true. But when you sell a covered call, you're not reducing your downside risk at all. So essentially, you're capping your upside. You're not reducing your downside much more than the tiny pennies of premium. And you're now skewing your risk reward ratio. So for me personally, I never sell covered calls on stocks or ETFs that are part of a trend following strategy. The only time I sell covered calls is when I am actively trying to get paid to get rid of my shares. So I have an option strategy, for example. I don't want to pull it up here. It might take a while. It's called the wheel of fun. Essentially, it's based around the concept that you can sell a cash secured put option on a stock, for example. So Apple or stock XYZ trading at $100. You can sell that hundred, you can sell a $95 put option and you can get a little bit of premium for that. If it drops below 95, you're on the hook and you actually have to take the shares, but you still kept your premium. So you made a little bit of money and now you own the shares. If that's the case, then I turn around and I aggressively sell covered calls to try to get rid of that position. So I might turn around and sell the $100 covered calls, basically trying to get rid of it and get the most amount of money possible. In that case, selling covered calls is great because yes, you can go very close to the money very aggressively. And when you lose your shares, that's actually what you want. But for us, no, it, it's, a, it's a terrible balance of the risk reward. You're, you're giving up too much to get too little. And in the long run, the performance would actually be even worse because we'd be messing around far too often with buying back contracts that went way against us. I don't want to get rid of my MDY. We're in a, a very good environment. We've got the volatility barometer. It's, it's in a pretty good range right now. I don't want to get rid of my shares. So I would just be week after week being forcing myself to, you know, lose those pennies on the premium. And then every three or four weeks when it drops down and you lose money, the covered call, okay, you got a few cents, but it, it didn't reduce your downside risk. So um, not for me, but in the wheel of fun strategy at VTS options, yes, we do sell covered calls. All right, how long have we been going? All right, pretty good. I didn't babble on too long about the VIX there. I definitely have a tendency to ramble, so. It's too bad there's no alarm bells or something that people can start ringing. You know, 
okay, we get it. You've been talking forever. Again, you know, you can just start ringing that bell. Apparently, um, I, I definitely need that, but I'll try to try to keep my rambles to a minimum. Sometimes people like when I go off on tangents and I rant on things, but I'll try to stay on topic. All right, can you add me on the list for the overlay and give us a few words about how it has been going lately? Um, the way that you get on, this is very hyper-specific to VTS, so apologies to everybody else. This is a paid, paid dollar question. Um, the way that you get on the overlay is to buy the annual subscription. So um, the overlay, for anybody who's interested, what this is essentially, we have one of our strategies, it's called the vol trend down here. We are essentially selling VXX put options. Um, I consider it sort of a quasi short volatility trade. Of course, it's technically long vol because when you sell a short VXX put option, you want the VXX to go up. But what I actually do it for is, let's pull up the VXX here. Screen share, good stuff. Um, what I'm actually looking for is this constant bleed of VXX. And I'm just trying to stay a little bit ahead of it with my put sales. So for example, I sold the 27 for next Friday. I'd be super happy if the VXX was a 2701. That would be a absolutely perfect expiration. Uh, so it is sort of acting as a short vol while being technically inverse my other equity positions. But the way that you get on the overlay, all the overlay is, is this leveraged. That's all it is. So we've got the standard five strategies, and then we've got the leverage strategies where we will use two times ETFs. We will take the aggressive vol instead of the tactical vol. We will take the SSO instead of the SPY, the QLD instead of the Qs. These are all leveraged. I don't offer the leveraged version to everybody for the vol trend because it does come with some unique risk and what I would say increased risk. So the way to get on this is to buy an annual subscription to VTS. And what that does is it means that I'm gonna have a full year to explain, to help you manage risk, to explain all of the bad trades that go against us and why it happened. I'm gonna have a full year. I don't want people looking at this leveraged version for a couple of months and then getting the wrong idea, going off on their own and leveraging it and getting themselves into trouble. It can get people into trouble. So the way to get on that, to answer the question, is to get on the annual subscription. And it's not a price increase. It's actually a 20% discount. Um, to get on the overlay is not, I don't ask anybody to pay extra money ever. Um, it's a 20% discount to get the annual. So that's the way that you do it. But I just don't wanna be talking to people who are just stopping by for a few weeks or a few months. There are some unique risks that you need to be aware of with that type of strategy. So I like to, I like to ask people to just commit for a year and then I'll just give you everything, um, everything you need to know. Okay, this looks technical. Hope people are interested in these types of things. If you regress the barometer on the ratio of VIX to VIX 6M, you get an R2 value of 0.98. Barometer is the simple linear function slope, intercept slope 220. There's gotta be more to this question. I'm not seeing any follow up. So what would you be asking here? Are you getting at the fact that it is high? That you're essentially saying that there's a high correlation between my barometer and the cash VIX term structure? If that's what you're asking, I mean, you have to remember that these comparisons, if you are not using any baselines, then they can also be quite deceiving. I mean, there are times when you could say, hey, the correlation between I don't know, sales of Titleist golf hats is, is, has a very high R2 value with um, tickets purchased on cruise ships or something, you know, like just totally unrelated things. You can also get pretty high numbers. So if your question is that, I would say yes and no. Um, the same result would come if you did, instead of the VIX 6M here, if you did different things like the VIX futures, for example, if you did um, some of the other metrics that I'm tracking, a lot of them, like all of the things in the volatility markets are correlated. The point I think of the barometer is that if you'll notice the barometer, ah, oh, that's not a long-term chart. 
Uh, what spreadsheet do I have open? And I have the wrong spreadsheet open. Okay, I'll just have to go by memory. But this is a one-year chart. Just imagine a 10-year chart of this. It, the highest ever is 90.55. And the lowest ever, I believe, is somewhere in the 13s or something like that. It'll never get above 90, and it'll never go below 10. And the reason that's happening is because it's a comprehensive metric of many, many different things. The VIX to VIX 6M, for example, the slow crossover signal, this will say 100th percentile sometimes. It will say zero percentile sometimes. So when you're using that as a trade signal, yes, you can get the absolute highest and the absolute lowest. But the way that I invest, I don't want to be trading unless it cross-references with many, many other things. So for me, while there is definitely a correlation with all of these things, and quite a high one, to be honest, I, I, it's just the way that I translate this barometer into actual trade signals, it's actually pretty far removed from the individual calculations. So while I would agree with you that if you picked any one of these individually, if you picked the traders VRP, there's going to be a correlation there, substantially high correlation. But that does not translate to the same trades at all. Whether that means, okay, I'm going to buy the MDY or I'm going to buy the, sell the VXX. Making that leap from a number to an actual trade signal, that's where the barometer shows its strength for me. So... I, sorry, I'm kind of assuming that that was your general question, the direction you were going, because I don't see any follow-ups. If there was, I'm sorry, I don't see it on my end. But yeah, there's, um, there's obviously a correlation there. I don't use any individual metrics like that, the VIX to VIX 6M. Super valuable. I think it's a very important thing to keep track of, but I would never base a trade decision on that metric alone. I, I think that it, it misses the boat in many, many instances where I would like to have at least five or six different metrics agreeing with each other before I start taking trades. Buy and hold of, buy and hold of SVXY, 0 0.5 of the old XVXY or one times the new gives 23% return per year since inception. Is it a good return? Good question. There's a, lot of, there's a lot dug into this thing under the surface here. So I can't confirm the numbers, but for anybody watching, the 0 0.5 to 1, what you're saying is, on February 27th, 2018, the SVXY ETF, which is a short ball ETF, tracks the front two months of the VIX futures, it was deleveraged to 0 0.5 times. It used to be minus 1 of the VIX futures, a short vol, basically minus 1 leverage, now it's 0 0.5, has been for the last three and a half years. So the actual return, let's just say you're right, 23%, is that a good return? Absolute, yes. If you can make 23% a year, you are in the top 1% of global investors. If you can do that for the next 10, 20 years, 30 years, you'll easily be in the top 1% of investors around the world, easily. A 23% annual return is phenomenal. The problem with what you're doing is, investing is emotions as well. And I'm sure you're aware of how big the drawdowns were with this type of strategy. I mean, if you're buy and hold the SVXY, you have to remember it lost 96% of its value in one day. So how do you buy and hold something? You're a human being, right? You're not a cyborg. You can't watch your money drop 96% and say, oh, it's fine, it'll come back. That's not how investing works. So it's the same thing as all those people say, oh, why didn't I just buy Amazon and just hold it for, you know, hold it for 20 years? Why didn't I just buy and hold Apple? Look at how much money I would have. Are you aware of how big the drawdowns were along the way and how many points along that curve you would have pulled the plug and totally exited it? Because now we can look back with perfect hindsight and we can say, well, all you have to do is hold it. Sure, but in the moment, you didn't know that. And on February 6, 2018, when you woke up the next day and you lost 96% of your money, it'd be pretty irrational for you to say, all right, I'll just hold it. I'll just keep going because, yeah, it's going to come back. It's no problem. I'll just go to work today and I'll just ignore it. Life doesn't work that way. So drawdown management, the reason that I can get people a return 
is because it my annualized return number is very good right but the reason that i never highlight it i'm never out there marketing you won't go on twitter and see me talking about my annualized return numbers i don't do that because that's the headline number that pulls on people's emotional strings again like i said what i'm most proud of is my ultra low correlation to the s p which means we have had hardly any we had a two percent drawdown in uh in 2020 during the COVID, during all those things, all those spikes and volatility events, we had a 2% portfolio drawdown. There would be no reason for somebody to not trust the long-term process. SVXY, start to finish, is roughly the same performance. But you can't honestly say that emotionally it would be the same experience, right? So this, this is essentially what you're trying to get at. That's why I harp so much on risk-adjusted metrics, and I hardly ever point people in the, in the direction of annual return. It's the same thing as our leveraged portfolio, right? When we start getting into our leveraged positions, I guess I could be all over Twitter talking about the, the actual raw return numbers, but I would rather highlight the fact that an ulcer of over 10 means that there's no stress involved here. There's holding SVXY would be a complete nightmare. I, I don't even know how irrational a person would have to be to make that part of how they invest. It's, you'd have to not care at all about your life and your capital. It's just, how could a person who works hard day to day to save money, watch it drop 96% and just, all right, Let's come back in 10 years. Let's just do this and come back in 10 years. Investing just simply doesn't work that way. So I would strongly encourage not just this question about SVXY, but strongly encourage people to ignore annualized return and start focusing on risk-adjusted metrics, ulcer, Sortino ratios, all these things, drawdown, maximum drawdowns, correlation to the S&P. I have a whole series on YouTube that you need to watch if this is a question. If that was a, like a, an actual, hey, I wonder if I should just do this type of question, um, you need to go on my YouTube channel. Risk adjusted. I've got a whole series, part one, part one to part five. Sharp, ulcer, maximum drawdown, correlation, how they all work together. Just watch this five-part series. You'll notice that I'm not talking about annualized return numbers. That's not how you become a successful investor. You really, really need to focus in on what a real human being can do with their capital, right? So I, I don't disagree with you that sometimes when you look at things and you say, well, if I only bought it there and kept it there, it would be great. Yes, it would, but 0% of people can actually do that. So um, risk-adjusted return metrics, not absolute return metrics. It's the difference between real emotions and just terminal results, which are irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. So what risks should I consider if I buy SVXY directly? If you follow my signals, which I can only ever be responsible for what I put out there, the, the main risks that you're looking for is a single day catastrophic volatility spike. Because of the way that we trade on a sort of a structural level, I give out new trade signals every single day. I check the metrics every morning, the new metrics in the moment, and I send out the signals. Now, most of the time, it means we're just going to maintain the same position. We don't if we're in SVXY yesterday, I get technically a new signal today to confirm that it's still a hold, but we're not gonna sell it and then rebuy it. We just maintain the position. But technically speaking, I'm trading on one day timeframes. So if something really bad happens in the market, we're gonna get out of SVXY tomorrow, right? The very next day we can get out. We can move to safety and we can minimize the damage. So from my perspective, the only risk would be, well, there's two risks. The first risk would be that catastrophic day where we hope it never happens, but I always assume that it will. I always assume that I want to manage my portfolio as if next week we're going to see a flash crash. I always make sure that I'll be okay if that happens. So diversification. But that's the only risk. The other risk you could technically say is credit risk from the issuer. Of course, if something happens and the issuing banks go bankrupt overnight, yeah, it could be a little bit of a problem there too. But 
Um, tech, I mean, from a practical sp perspective, the risk is a out of nowhere catastrophic day where volatility went from being low to high. And the reason I highlight that is it's really not happened very often. So uh, the reason that we were full in safety on the Volpocalypse in February, 2018, is because there were, there were so many warning signs before Volpocalypse happened that I think it's just not saying ignorant as an insult, saying ignorant as uninformed about a certain thing. It's just ignorant of the volatility markets if you were short vol on February 5th. That's just a, a blatant lack of understanding of volatility. There were warning signs going all the way back to the end of January that something was really wrong and people should have been in safety. COVID, that should not have been a problem for any short volatility traders. It was one of the easiest things in the world to see coming. I could say the opposite. I could say I'm a genius because I didn't lose money during COVID. But the truth is it was one of the most easily recognizable volatility spikes that I've ever seen. Anybody who was short vol heading into the end of February 2020 just doesn't know what they're doing. So financial crisis, same thing. You could say, oh, Lehman was such a terrible event. Yeah, but you wouldn't have been short vol for weeks before that if you knew what you were looking at. So the risk of that one day spike isn't just a one day spike. Those happen all the time. The risk is a one day spike literally out of nowhere, just low vol to wow, this is crazy. Like February 27th, 2007, Asian currency crisis. The VIX is in the 11s. I think it was 1118. The next day it's 18. I mean, just an out of nowhere, that would have hit every single short vol trader, every option trader, that would have been devastating for everyone. Nobody saw that coming. October 87, I wouldn't have been in any risky positions the day before that happened. That would not have caught me off guard at all. The VIX was over 30 the day before Black Monday. Um, so a lot of these spikes are, are, you know, you can see them coming a mile away. The risk is we have to assume that there's, is that the same? That's a different question. Um, we have to assume that there's going to be a day that surprises everybody, including me, one of the safest, most conservative investors out there. I'm going to get caught at some point too. I always assume that's going to happen tomorrow. And um, that's really how you should manage your portfolios. Just assume that I don't care how good you are, assume that even you are going to be fooled by something and it's going to hurt bad and make sure that when it hurts badly, it doesn't put you out of business. You, you have to live to fight another day. And uh, those are the risks of holding short vol. Hopefully we can catch 95% of them ahead of time. Assume every now and then you're going to get hit with something unexpected. All right. Not to discourage anybody from trading a small percentage of their portfolio short vol. I think that's a very good idea. But small being the operative word, don't, <laughs> I don't care how easy it is and how much money you've made and how smooth it, it seems to be. Um, keep it small no matter what. People ask me that all the time. Like my tactical volatility strategy, live trading has made 50% a year since I launched it in 2012, 10 years. Why don't you just put all your money in that? Well, this is why, because eventually something's gonna surprise even me. And I don't want all my money in something that, yeah, I can catch 90% of the bad days, but um, I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna get caught out in the rain without an umbrella at some point. And uh, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm gonna survive that, so. Short vol traders sometimes get too excited about uh, short-term periods of success. Okay, here's one. I cross talks hard, but I'm gonna try to follow this. So, cause we do have another vol guy who, this person for anybody watching also manages a volatility strategy. Um, I wonder if I know the website name. I apologize, I don't know the website off, off the top of my head, but I'll try to keep up with this question. What's better for buy and hold then as far as you think? I think that's coming from the SVXY question. All right, Ilya, let's see what you say. Tough to say. I'd look into simplify asset management and holding a diversified portfolio of some of those ETFs. I don't know what simplify is, so can't follow along on this too much. Buy and hold, 
on Google and tech. A problem again is we're people, we're human beings. And you got to remember that in the dot com bust, which we're approaching those valuation levels, sort of similar to dot com levels. The NASDAQ itself dropped 78% in the dot com bust. And a lot of the individual stocks, some of the very best ones at that time, dropped 80, 90, 95% during that period. And we're human beings. So that's going to hurt and it's going to hurt bad. So when you're talking about buy and hold, I would just say universally across the board, it's a terrible idea. Not because the terminal results will be bad. Those are demonstrably good on certain underlying assets. You can clearly say that buy and hold on Apple is a fantastic trade. But for a human being, it's one of the worst trades there is because you'll never be able to have confidence when you get hit with one of those drawdowns. You will sell. You'll pull the plug and you'll ruin the whole process. So buy and hold across the board is just a no-go, in my opinion, right? I'm just one person, but in my opinion, uh, that's 100% true of, of everything. Buy and hold is... With just a few basic filters, you can improve your results so much better than buy and hold. So I would say just don't even go down that road. Just accept the fact that you're going to have to be tactical in some capacity to succeed, especially going forward in this crazy world of mass stimulus and probably more fiscal stimulus coming and, and all these. It's just crazy. Um, you got to focus on tactical investing. Forget buy and hold. You never have success long term with that. Interesting. Do you think in the future you'll have to stop accepting subscribers? The bigger you get, the most difficult it is to get the awesome results. I'm just thinking here, did I haven't even uploaded that video yet? Apologies. Uh, I think it's in my bin for the queue. So Within a week, I promise you, there's a video that I have. It's ready. It's done. I just haven't uploaded it yet. I think the title is um, Why Don't Hedge Funds Copy You? Something like that. Clever, I know. Uh, I'm terrible at YouTube. Terrible at thumbnails and titles. And I don't do any shock, like clickbait stuff. Um, but anyway, it's, it's addressing this exact question. Is there a point where you're going to be phased out, where you get so many subscribers or so much capital running through your strategies that it will start to sort of diminish the edge, so to speak? Um, spoiler alert, no, but you will definitely want to watch that 10 or 15 minute video that I'm going to launch, giving you sort of a step-by-step -step five or six reasons why that's not the case. But um, stopping accepting subscribers would only happen if the literally the workload got too much as far as actual capital no if you look at what we trade the video is going to be far better so obviously i should i should keep this super short just wait for the video but if you look at the things that we're trading we're talking about multi-billion dollar ETF. We, we don't trade any low float stuff at all. I understand that 95% of the gurus out there, you know, the, the traders that you'll find on Twitter, the reason they're posting such great results is they're front running a community on somewhat low float options usually. I mean, that's nine out of 10 times when you see someone talking about great results, that's what it is. They're not talking about the cues. They're not talking about holding multi-billion dollar ETFs. Look at what we're holding. Um, MDY, IEF, GLD. These are VXX, the, v the VXX options market, super liquid. All of these over a bill, way, way over a billion. Um, everything we do, that's all we do, is super high liquidity, long-term, stable, broad market ETFs. There's no individual stocks that are tough to get in and out of. There's no options that are questionable, super wide bid ask spreads. Um, just to give you a little behind the scenes as well, not only do I have the subscribers, right, the fairly large community from 66 countries around the world, but I also have a company, a consulting firm, had it for a long time. I don't advertise it, um, but I have a consulting firm, Prosperitas, that... Um, I license out my strategies to hedge funds, RIAs, family offices. There's a lot of capital going through my strategies, far beyond what the subscriber base does. Um, to, to be honest, the capital from the subscribers is the least of 
not that I'm concerned at all, but that would be the smallest volume that we have going. I, I, there's substantially more going through, I don't know how many clients. I mean, of course, because of NDAs, I can't disclose any numbers, but no, we're, we're miles away from being, um, being volume an issue with, with how we trade. Uh, I, I make sure, like I said, I made it a point to say, my investing is available for literally anybody. That's, that's the point of my business. That's how this all started for me. I never set out to do a subscription model. It's, it wasn't my goal to be where I'm at now. It was just basically demand, people asking. But the one thing that I set out to make sure that I'm doing is this has to be available to everybody. Wealthy people, people who are just starting out, people who trade in IRA accounts, P Canadians in RRSP accounts, Europeans. I, I really try hard to make it accessible for Europeans, even though it's difficult sometimes. Apologies for you Europeans. Um, I don't care what country you're in or all of that. And the only way to really do that is to make it very, very high liquidity stuff. And only that. There's no sort of small area of what I do that okay, you can do this, but be careful of this one because you're going to get phased out because of volume. No, none of that. We are miles away from having to worry about that. I don't think we'll ever have to worry about that. But um, to answer the question, no. Uh, the subscriber base is the least of uh, our volume. We have much more volume going through um, more, more traditional investment um, methods, if so to speak. Ilya, yes take a long time, a long time. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm always, probably always going to be a very, very small fish in a massive ocean. That's basically what, what he's getting at. And, and it's absolutely true. We're, I'm not concerned that, oh, wow, VTS is going to, it's going to sweep the world and we're going to have, you know, a trillion dollars in assets or something. It's never, never going to be an issue. But good question. And I do have a video coming to explain. This is interesting. I tried to guess your barometer structure above. Oh, are you the same person that asked that um, correlation question? You are. Okay, you were fishing for some, I give you credit for trying to fish. I share a lot, but I, you probably won't trip me up, but you can try, anybody can try, come on the live streams and try. Maybe I'll reveal something that I shouldn't have gone that far at some point in the future. Neither confirm nor deny. Which VIX, which VIX ratio is the fastest to spike up when the trend moves bearish? Excellent question. Um, so I track three for people in our daily emails. What the cash VIX term structure actually is, is we all know, well, not we all know, but if you're aware of what the VIX index is, right, a annualized, forward 30-day calculation of implied volatility, there are also the calculations for different time frames. So there's a nine-day, a three-month, a six-month, and a one-year. This is the cash VIX term structure. And of course, this is very, very important for volatility traders, quant-based systematic volatility traders to focus on. If you're talking about which is the fastest, I actually label them as far as speed, so it's even easier. The VIX 9D to VIX is the fast crossover because this is a nine day compared to a 30 day. This is of course the short time frame. It's going to move the fastest. Think of it as exponential moving averages, right? What type of moving average moves quicker? A, a 50 day or a 10 day, right? Obviously a 10 day EMA is gonna move a lot faster or an SMA or whatever, 200 day is gonna be the slow one. It's the same thing with this cash VIX term structure. The one that spikes up the quickest is this one. You can easily see a situation where if volatility spikes, you get a kink in this, where the VIX 9D is actually up here, and then it goes down to the VIX, and then the other follow suit like that. Then if there's a little bit of follow through in the volatility market, you might notice that the VIX goes over one. I don't know if you can see these numbers. Um, but it says 0 0.8, 0 0.73. When this gets over one, that represents that the VIX 90 is actually above the VIX, which means there's some short-term fear. That fast crossover 
it really doesn't take very much to get that to go over one. The medium term, the VIX to VIX 3M ratio, this is a 30 day to a three month. So that one's gonna be slower moving. The, the volatility market, all of the real capital that's going through the VIX futures, the S&P 500 options, the whole volatility complex, you're gonna need more than just a single day spike to get everybody shifting their real capital towards longer term trades. So that VIX 3M takes a little bit longer than the VIX nine day. The nine day can move up and down. So I actually don't use the nine day very often. It would be more valuable for really short term traders, intraday traders. Whereas for me, like I said, I'm a trend follower. I look for hopefully weeks, sometimes months. So that VIX to VIX 3M is useful. Then the 6M, if there's legitimate fear, that 6M will go over one as well. So just for a future reference, when we're looking at volatility spikes, say Q4 2018. October 4th, that's the went drop 20% at the end of Q4 2018. October 4th, probably the VIX 9D went above one. October 5th and 6th, or I think it went to the 9th. Yeah, October 6th, probably the VIX 3M went over one. And then because it was a legitimate scare and there seemed to be some staying power in the fear, then the VIX 6M and the VIX 1Y will go over one. So that's how it's gonna happen. You're gonna have a, see if I can do this on camera. You're gonna have a curve like this. The VIX 9D will spike quickly and it'll kink. And then the curve is gonna start to move up. If the fear is legitimate, and that information gets disseminated into the market and people realize, wow, this is serious. I need to actually move some capital around. Then you're gonna get that middle kink to sort of move up and the far end of the curve going down. And it's going to go from what should be a contango curve to a kink up down, kind of like that. Hopefully you got the gear effect there on camera. But when the VIX 3M and the VIX 6M start to show fear as well and they go over one, now you wanna pay attention. When the VIX 9D goes over one, yeah, give it a look, but it's it's really not, um, there's a lot of false positives. If you're trading on the VIX 9D ratio by itself, you can get whipsawed quite a bit. So I would, I would take the whole curve into account. Okay, I think, yeah, there you go. Good way to answer it. See how much I ramble? about VIX futures ratios. Yeah, same thing. Hopefully VIX Central is actually up and running. Um, what have we got? No, it's still down, but I think you know what the general contango looks like. So it's the same thing. The M1 future, which is the front month future, VX1, that will go the quickest, right? That can go into backwardation really quite quickly. But then when you're looking at things like the um, M4 to M7, we track that as well. M1, M2 futures can go into backwardation quite quickly. To get the M4 to M7 futures in backwardation, it takes a legitimate acceptance that whatever's surprising the market right now, it's probably here to stay for a little while. Am I doing a screen share? I am not. What an idiot. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. I don't know how much I was talking there without screen share, but these two ratios as well, when you're talking about the VIX futures, it's the same concept. The longer term measurement you're looking at, the slower it is to move, but probably the more robust of a signal it will be. So if you're looking at M1, M2 as some type of threshold for going short vol, cash, long vol, it's going to be a little bit noisier. You're gonna be whipsawed a lot more. If you're looking at M4 to M7, it's much slower moving, but when it spikes, or in this case drops down to negative numbers, it means the market has acknowledged there's something to worry about right now. Um, everything is like that in the markets. All long-term is slower moving, but more accurate than the short-term stuff. As a trader, you're gonna have to balance where you are on that spectrum, right? If, if you're too short, you're gonna get whipsawed constantly. If you're too long, it's gonna keep you in bad trades for too long. You're not gonna get out because you have to wait until the whole market acknowledges that it's scary. Try to find where you are somewhere in the middle. And everybody's going to be different. I, I know where exactly where I'm at, but I um, can't tell you because you are you and you might have a different portfolio. 
So I'm trying to keep up here. It's a lot of, which I like, people asking questions, answering. I want this to be a community where people can, you know, it's very rare that people can just chat about this type of thing. And so pretty cool. Type of average do I use in my metrics? Okay, good question. I don't know how much I can answer for you without. So I use zero averages. The, the long-term median of course, I feel like medians are far more useful than mean because the mean is, uh, where's my sheet that I made? The, the mean always gets dragged up or down based on outliers. In the case of volatility, of course, outliers are tail risk on the far end, so it gets dragged up. But there are other types of metrics that might be dragged down by super low outliers. Regardless, I don't find mean overly effective. Mode... It, for VIX specifically, very useful, but for some of the other metrics, not so much. So I would just, if I was you, you always default to median. 80 to 90% of the time, that's gonna be the best measure of what the actual average is. But what I use is percentiles. Everything, because everything in the market is relative. A number itself doesn't mean anything. Like cash VIX oscillator, what my cash VIX oscillator is, is basically, it's my own formula of calculating the momentum between each one of these five metrics, the sort of the, the momentum in between here and here and here and here, and then how they all relate to each other. So, but the number itself doesn't mean anything. That's just an absolute number. The percentile is what I'm really looking at. The median is important just for people to know that the dead center middle number is 6.59. We are above that. But this is the important number. How far above? Relative to what and where are we? So the VIX itself right now, I said it's uh, based on the median, right? It's above the median, but how far? 56.7%. That's the meaningful number relative to. Um, and everything I do is percentiles and differences in short-term momentum. Stuff that is measuring one thing compared to another and then taking that calculation in relation to history, right? So there's two components of percentiles. This to this, beta factor, relationship, and then that to history. And, um, and that's what I, I find is most useful for me. Everything's relative. I mean, when people say, oh, the take um, short, short volatility, buy the SVXY or short the VXX, don't ever short directly, but you get the point. Go short vol when the VIX is below 16, right? You'll hear people say stuff like this from time to time, or when the VIX futures drop below 17, that's a time to short vol. That number means nothing. It's completely irrelevant. 17 in 2017 would have kept you out of every single trade the entire year. For 18 months straight, you would not have been short vol because the VIX never got there, right? The VIX averaged 11.09 in 2017. So if you're using absolute numbers to say above and below this, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z, what does that matter? It's just completely irrelevant. The, the market looks so different today compared to 2017, 2008, 1993. They, these are all completely different. But the relative changes between them are surprisingly accurate and consistent. So I would say... Median's the best one, but go further and, and rank everything in percentiles as well. This is true. This goes back to one of the earlier questions. All the comments about buying UVXY on a specific day and then selling it on a specific day and saying it will work, that should be super easy to test with real data and Excel. I love this because this is what I always tell people as well. When you look at my streams, right, and we're on, this is just one of like five spreadsheets I have, but like this is, this is what I do. If you say something to me and it passes my macro smell test where I'm like, yeah, that sounds like it's pretty good idea. Let's, let's see if that works. I will open up a new spreadsheet. I'll go to the very end of my spreadsheet. Again, this is, I have to have many, many spreadsheets or it crashes my computer, but I'll just open up a new spreadsheet. I'll get, you know, the date, I'll do UVXY, I'll do um, the, whatever, the UVXY percent change. I'll just go through all of this 
and and then we'll go and we'll say okay if you just if if this is greater than whatever you're saying i don't even know like 17 then you're going to go uh long uvxy otherwise you're going to go to cash whatever you're talking about sorry <laughs> i'm typing this too fast but test it this is so easy to do you can just when you tell me it's like this person commenting exactly on the money if you're going to sit there and tell me that doing this on thursday and then selling it on friday is profitable i don't think that would take you more than one cup of coffee and an hour or two in Excel and you could actually say, okay, maybe it worked for the last three occurrences, but is that effective? Why not just find out why? I guess this is what led me 15 years later to being where I'm at is that I never leave everything up to, I feel like that would work or it appears to me like that might have worked. There's no appears to be with what I do with work. I test everything. And so when you say that this is working, that's why I got back to the original point of, I don't think so. I mean, all the data that I've done season and actually measured seasonality and days. And what if you did this on that time frame? I've been doing this for, you know, over a decade, just thousands and thousands of, of hours spent with coffee and um, iced frappuccinos, just calculating dumb stuff. And the vast majority of the time you realize, oh, okay, that's just, sure, it would have worked for the last five months, but look at how terrible it worked, you know, two years ago. That's what it will lead you to. So test it, please. I would never discourage anybody from any ideas that they have. If you think that will work and you, you're saying it has worked with real money, that's awesome. You've made money. Now you have to go one step further. You have to actually figure out whether that strategy is actually effective going back on a long-term scale. And then even if you could show that it is, now you're getting to like level four, level five of a backtesting system, then you have to decide, okay, if it did work going back 10 years, now you have to step back and do another macro test. Is there any reason to believe that it will continue to work going forward? Because I can show you a million things that worked out extremely well going backwards. I could create back tests that blow your mind at how good the, the profit curve looks like. But then you have to ask yourself, okay, is that curve fitted? Is that just an overfit because I already know what happened? I'm already looking with perfect hindsight. Is it going to work going forward? What reasons do I have? What could go wrong? Play devil's advocate. What you'll find most of the time is these ideas that we have, and I do it too. I prove myself wrong 10 times for every one per one time that I find something that's actually worthwhile. Um, I, I would imagine you're going to prove yourself wrong quite quickly on this one. But at least you have the cash in your account that you can say it wasn't a costly lesson. You will probably learn the lesson that what you're saying is is not is not a good way to make money but you got money in your pocket while doing something that's basically just a function of the market, which is great. Oftentimes we learn the best lessons through financial, financial cost, right? It seems in your case, you get to learn a valuable lesson about the difference between short-term success and long-term history while making a profit. That's awesome. I love that. Unfortunately for me, because I'm so... I have such a high attention to detail that oftentimes my biggest lessons do come from um, losing some money. It, it does take that hit, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't the case, but just it's just the way it is. All right, how long have we been going? We should cut this. Hour and a half, 56 people watching. Bitcoin. It wouldn't be a stream if we didn't say at least one thing about Bitcoin. So here we go. Playing around with BTC 10 years ago, got scammed and lost what would have been millions today. Getting into more serious trading now later in life, I can guarantee I would not have held it until today. Yeah. When people ask me, because I knew about Bitcoin when it was way below a dollar. I actually wrote an article years ago. I, I was debating publicly with an article basically saying, here's the pros and cons of, I was going to put $10,000 into Bitcoin. 
and I would have bought 10,000 Bitcoins. I, actually more, it was something 13,500 or something. So it was, it was maybe in the 70 cent range. I would have had a lot of Bitcoins, right? But I know, I'll re I don't regret it. I regret not making 20 grand or 30, 50 grand, which was what I probably would have made. But I know my brain, I know myself. If I bought Bitcoin at 70 cents, I would have sold it at $2 for sure. I told this, the story already of I owned Apple stock at $17. And that was pre both of the recent splits, both of the one to four and the one to seven. I owned Apple at 17 bucks, basically the equivalent of close to a dollar. I owned Apple in 20 years ago and I sold it. I tripled my money and I sold it. So I don't look back and say, boy, if I would have held it, I'd have $9 million or whatever it is. I look back and say, I'm a systematic trader that, that needs quantifiable signals to get in and out of things. And if something doubled or tripled in value, I don't have the brain that can hold things. I just don't. It's just not part of, of how I invest. It's not right or wrong. Everybody has to know who they are. And I'm not the type of person that can buy and hold something and realize 10,000% profits or whatever it turns out to be. I'll sell that thing the second it doubles or triples and I'll be happy to do it. So I'm kind of in your camp here. I didn't actually end up buying Bitcoin. I've never owned any crypto, but even if I did, I probably would have made 50 grand, something like that. It wouldn't have been life-changing for me. It wouldn't have been, oh, I, yeah, technically I would have just, I don't even know how many millions, right? No, I wouldn't. I know I wouldn't. Um, hindsight's 2020, but in the moment, absolutely, I would have sold it immediately. Jumps to two bucks. I would, I would have just, I would have written 10 articles about how I doubled my money and, and that would have been it. And then when it's two, for me, it would have felt expensive. So it's not like I would have turned around and bought it at three or five or a hundred or a thousand or whatever it was. No, it, it would have felt expensive. Um, Las Vegas Sands, I had that stock at $2. I don't even know what it is now, but I, I bought a serious allocation at two bucks. I sold it at seven. Well, sure, I could have held it forever, but my brain doesn't work that way. And I just wouldn't have. And then when it was seven, I thought I was a genius. I, I tripled my money. It was amazing. And then it went to 10 and then 13 and then 15. And when it's 15, I can't buy it anymore because I, I held it at two or three. So it feels expensive to me and I can't get back in it. And then it goes from 15 to 60, right? That's investing. You, you really have to know who you are and, and maybe more importantly, who you're not. And everything you do has to fit your brain and your emotions. And, and for me, tactical investing, quant signals, actually being able to say, this isn't my gut telling me that this strategy works. It's I can show you exactly why it works, right? I have to be able to do that or I can't buy it. So I feel bad for you, whatever the scam was in this Bitcoin thing. I, I, I mean, if your brain is anything like mine, you just put it out of your head. You just know that even if you didn't get scammed out of those coins, you probably would have sold it pretty quickly after that anyway. Even I can't handle a 96% drawdown. The way you worded that. Even I, so you're... You're saying you're just a super high risk trader, but even you can't manage 96. Drawdown management is one of the, I would say that of all the things in the investing world, the one thing that I find very consistent is that nearly everybody overestimates their risk tolerance. This is just a, a universal truth. When you talk to people about investing, they all think they can handle a 30% drawdown, a 40% drawdown. They all think that. And then when it happens, virtually everybody realizes that they can't. So yeah, I, I mean, 96, I can't handle a 20. The, the reason that I invest the way that I do, it might seem like, hey, why don't you go a little bit more or a lot more aggressive? You, you've only had a 7.7% drawdown. And that was only one right there. The rest of these, um, I can actually show you. This is our daily email. I mean, we have very, very low drawdowns. Um, you know, in the last nine years, we haven't had anything that went over 5.6. But 
that's because I've been investing for 15 years. I know my risk tolerance. I know when it hits 11, I get nervous. I know it sounds right now, people are like, 11? I can totally handle 11. Can you? Because I know that I start to get nervous at 11. I'd certainly get nervous at 15 or 20. I'd be looking for the exit door at 20 for sure. So that's why I invest the way that I do. This is my live capital. I'm not, my business is not built to impress people. It's literally 100% of my net worth. So I know my risk tolerance is way lower than people actually think that their own is. Um, yeah, I got to keep it under 10 if, if at all possible. 20 for sure, but, but 10 is comfortable. 10 is like, all right, I can be down 10% for six months, but I can't be down 20% for two years. It's just unacceptable for me. And the vast majority of people highly overestimate their risk tolerance until it happens with real money. And then you find out the hard way, you capitulate, you pull the plug and you screw everything up. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much. We'll cap it here. I got a great view here in Panama and I kind of regret, I've been here for two weeks and this is the first, first I've actually let people stare at that instead of this dumb face. So I'm gonna try to do a few more. We'll do, um, for sure next week, we'll do another one of these. And then all these questions, there's you know 50 more. I, I can't get to all of these. Apologies if I didn't get to yours. Maybe just let Ilya plug something here if that's what you're doing in less than 60 day. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of good data. So if you want, you can put your website in the comment section for people to uh, get the link. And otherwise, thanks everybody. And see you next time.